uh, they speak to, to speak to us about how they see things on the ground and they also try and answer some of your questions. So do get those questions coming in. Um, today we've been, we're very lucky uh, to be joined by Huda Amori and we're hoping shortly to be also joined by Miko Pellet. Uh, Miko's in uh, Washington uh, and uh, we're tracking him down right now. But uh, in the meantime, we have Huda. Huda's in London. Uh, and um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about her shortly. But uh, Palestine Deep Dive, uh, we, there's, a, there's a daily newsletter. If you don't subscribe, please do. Uh, and also, if you go on to the Palestine Deep Dive your website, you'll be able to see some of the previous interviews that we've had with some really quite astounding and uh, uh, extraordinary people uh, who know what they talk of uh, and have uh, actually thrown a light uh, in, in, in a very special way on the situation in Palestine and the Middle East. Uh, I'm Mark Seddon. Uh, I used to work for Al Jazeera Television, and then I went to work for the United Nations. I worked for the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and more recently, the President of the UN General Assembly. And I've taken a long interest in uh, issues around Palestine. But you're not really here to listen to me. You're here to listen and speak with uh, Huda, uh, and also hopefully Miko. Now, just a bit of background um, about Huda. Uh, she's a British campaigner, uh, an activist of Palestinian and Iraqi heritage. Uh, she studied at Manchester University, where she founded the BDS campaign University of Manchester before working for the Pol Palestine Solidarity Campaign and leading their apartheid off-campus campaign. Uh, and that's where she investigated the investment portfolios of hundreds of UK universities. And actually that's one issue that I think um, many of us will be interested in hearing a bit more about as well. And since then, she's gone on to co-found Palestine Action, uh, which is a new organization involved in direct action against companies operating in the United Kingdom, uh, which are heavily involved in enabling Israel's military occupation of Palestine. Um, before I come to uh, Huda, I'm just a quick introduction to Miko. Uh, hoping that he can join us soon. Miko uh, has been a guest on Palestine Deep Dive before. He's an author, an activist and speaker. He grew up in Israel and at first followed a military career before teaching martial arts across the world, before rediscovering his activism. In fact, here is Miko. Welcome, Miko. I'm in the process of reading out your biography to people. Good to be with Great you. To have you. Great to have you back. And thanks very, very much. Thank you. For you can hear me OK? We can hear you. We can hear Hi. you. Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm going to raise the volume a little bit. Fantastic. Well, whilst Miko's doing that, um, he's uh, he's one of the leading advocates of the boycott uh, and divestment movement and believes in a single one state uh, solution. Um, also, of course, we shouldn't forget. And if you haven't read them and haven't bought them, you must. Uh, he's the author of The General's Son, The Journey of an Israeli in Palestine and also Injustice, the story of the Holy Land Foundation 5, uh, which was published in 2018. So welcome to you both. Thank you very much for joining us. It's fantastic to have you. Um, we have got, uh, we're already getting people sending in uh, uh, questions and making uh, and, and sending in some, uh, some remarks. We'll come to them shortly because I actually wanted to start uh, by asking both of you some questions, if I may. Miko, if I could start with you. Um, the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement seems to be having a bit more of a difficult time um, than perhaps the anti-apartheid movement was having back when it was most uh, effective and uh, active, possibly in the 80s and 90s. Uh, it's not so much necessarily at activist level, uh, of course, there's a huge amount of enthusiasm, but there seems to be a blockage at a national and international level. Now, of course, the sanctions movement in South Africa took a long time to break through. A long, and there was a huge amount of resistance, as you'll recall. But tell us if there's a special degree of resistance to the BDS movement internationally and where it is and what can be done to overcome it. <laughs> <laughs> there you well, are. Thank, thank you for having me. Good to be with you. Good to be with you, Huda. <laughs> so I have two hour, uh, two hour lecture to give right now. I understand just from your question. Um, you know, the, you know, I, I don't know that how you make comparisons like this because historically, geographically, 
um, in terms of the population, in terms of there's so many vari variables here that I don't know that comparing um, the BDS struggle against apartheid in South Africa or the BDS struggle against apartheid in Palestine, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure we can, com you know, create, have that comparison. What I do know is this. I do know that the apartheid regime, the Zionist regime in Palestine, has learned a great deal from other struggles. And they have uh, really perfected their Hasbara, their PR, having learned from that. So they saw, you know, how things transpired in South Africa. They saw how things transpired in, you know, with, with prisoner, political prisoners in Ireland, the, the IRA people. They, they've, they've learned a great deal and they keep gathering and gathering information. And then they use that information to, uh, to create a, a more cruel, a more ruthless, a, uh, a more, um, uh, and a product that they're easier for them to sell. Now, on top of that, Zionism from the very, very beginning had this, um, the, the, the entire mythology, the entire Bible at their disposal. And so they always, so they use that. And of course, to many people of faith around the world, that speaks volumes. So when Naftali Bennett uh, says to Mehdi Hassan, look, uh, you know, if you say I don't have a right to it, then uh, you, you're, you're, you need to read the Bible. The Bible says I do. Well, number one, the Bible is not clear about that. So that's another conversation. But to many people, that's the end of the conversation. So they have all of that working for them. They have incredibly smart people, incredibly uh, talented people working for them. And they've been doing this for over 100 years. I have a poster right here on my wall advertising a lecture that my grandfather gave in Kiev in 1920 about you know the the virtues of zionism and why jewish people and others should support zionism and the quest of jewish people to so-called return so there's a lot of variants here there's a lot of variables here that work for the zionists and they use them very well and like i said they looked at south africa and they learned the lessons from apartheid south africa and they learned them very very well so the pr machine is very very strong another thing that here i'll say one more word i don't want to you know talk too long but here in the United States, one of the things that the Zionists learned very well is that all politics is local. And so if you run for school board, if you run for city council, you are going to be approached by Zionists. You are going to be invited to uh, a trip to Israel. So, you know, quote unquote, you are going to get a tons of material, wonderful, glossy, you know, very, very uh, attractive material that will convince you that throughout your career, whether again, it's you're running for school board and it's about the curriculum in public schools, whether you're writing, like I said, city council or a mayor or police chief, not to mention higher office, that they will be your go-to on every issue that relates to Israel-Palestine. And they do it in a very compelling way. So that also, you know, tends to, tends to help them a great deal when they come to, uh, when it comes to this issue of, Israel is an apartheid regime. We need to oppose it. Yes, but how can you say it's an apartheid regime when they're also nice and friendly and democratic and liberal and so on? So that is that that is really the challenge that we have here to make sure that these elected officials don't pick the Zionist side. Can, can you tell us something about? We come to Huda in a minute. So, something about the campaign itself and um, and, and how effective it is uh, in the states where you are. Uh, you know how how do you take it out to uh, colleges? not just colleges, but beyond that, to uh, elections. How do you counter that narrative that is being uh, portrayed by, uh, by people you say are very nice? How do you do it? Well, I think the colleges actually here in the United States and in the UK, and I'm sure Huda can talk about that more, but I've, I've been to the UK. I've been invited to speak in the UK a lot on college campuses there. And so I know a little bit about that. But here in the United States, the, the pro-Palestinian groups, the Palestinian voice has done tremendous and continues to do tremendous, tremendous work on the ground. These students are risking everything, everything. Sometimes they, they do get thrown out of school. Sometimes they have to start all over. I mean, the threats to them and their careers and their lives by the Zionists are, 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 are frightening. At the same time, they are dedicated and they have raised the level of conversation to the point where today, and I believe this is a great deal uh, thanks to them, and of course, you know, the, the other campaigns that, that, that uh, exist, 
um, to the point where we have members of the U.S. Congress, members of the U.S. Senate talking about conditioning aid to Israel. If you and I, if we, if we sat in a room five, ten years ago and somebody would suggest that a member of the U.S. Senate or the member of the U.S. Congress would call to condition aid to Israel with mm -hmm. Israel's um, compliance with international law and human rights towards the Palestinians, that would that have been absurd. So that's how you do it. This dedication on the ground or a grassroots dedication by these young students. And of course, mm -hmm. the, the, the general campaign, the BDS campaign by other organizations, mm -hmm. churches and so forth, uh, resolutions that have divestment resolutions and so on, have made it, you know, continue to make a very big difference. Just, just before, sorry, before I come to Huda, just, just one thing, because we, we just had a taste of it today. You'll be able to tell us more. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the situation at Harvard with Cornell West? Because many people in this country have heard of Cornell West and they will have known that he's, uh, he has essentially said he's leaving the university. He's, he can't stay there anymore because of the way an academic has been treated over her support for Palestine. But can you just, a bit of, if you could just tell us a little bit more about that? Well, unfortunately, I've not followed it other than just to see in the headlines. So I can't really speak to it at any, with any, any kind of, uh, any kind of depth. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know if you've uh, followed it, Huda, but I mean, it is an extraordinary situation whereby very often we see that in, not only in campuses in the United States, but also in the UK and elsewhere, people, advocates for the boycott and divestment and sanctions movement um, do face quite severe pushback and actually uh, attempts at muzzling them. Um, yeah. Tell us, if you will, uh, a bit more about the campaign itself uh, and what where it came from and what you're seeking to do is that directed to me it is huda yeah absolutely okay. um so for the general boycott divestment and sanctions movement um it came from a call from policy and civil society in 2005 essentially for the international community to boycott divest and sanction israel as a non-violent means to pressure israel into complying with international law and and um and human rights conventions, which should not be a, a massive ask, but unfortunately we have to campaign internationally and actually get companies and institutions which are so deeply embedded and profit and enabling Israel's apartheid regime um, to cut those ties in order to pressure, in order to isolate Israel um, and pressure them into complying with these quite quite basic um, demands from, from Palestinian civil society. Um, and I would say that it has had uh, great um, achievements um, since its launch. And I think for Palestinians like myself, um, boycotting was a kind of an instinctive thing that I always just grew up with, but actually giving it some sort of framework was crucial. Um, and I think the crucial thing when selling BDS as well is to look beyond what, what we often see as a consumer boycott and understand it on, a, on an institutional level um, and on a deeper level where you know, we see in the UK, we have universities invest um, over 450 million into these companies, which are supporting Israel's apartheid regime. We have pension funds investing over two billion pounds. And we have Israel's largest arms company, Elbit Systems, uh, producing weapons here on our doorsteps, um, which will be used in Israel's weapons and used to kill um, and massacre Palestinians, all against um, our own country's kind of you know, policies and what they is, is claim to advocate for human rights. And it's the same story everywhere when, when you look at these institutions. I mean, the universities, for example, they, um, I, 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 I kind of began campaigning very actively when I was at university and then when they found out about them investing in Caterpillar, um, a company who provides armored bulldozers for the Israeli army to demolish Palestinian homes in order to make way the ever expanding illegal Israeli settlements. Um, and at first I thought, I thought it would be quite simple because the university had a social responsibility investment policy which says you should not be investing in companies um, where there are human rights abuses. And despite providing numerous reports and evidence of this and thinking this should be a simple campaign, um, it wasn't and it took four years for the university to finally divest which only happened um, last year, and this is the story across the board for all of these institutions. We often in the West create this facade of support for human rights, uh, policies and arms exports controls, which are not abided by. Um, that they're simply to, 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 to make us feel like um, mm. we, are, we, are, we are in a civilized country which would not support um, apartheid. 
Um, did, did, did you, who, sorry to interrupt you, did you think that the university knew that, what, that their investments were, were, were effectively helping Caterpillar to, to build machinery that could, was being used in Israel? Was there ignorance there? Or did you find that once they did know, they still didn't want to act? What happened? I, I would say that um, on a certain level, there may have been a certain ignorance to begin with. But then um, after I pointed it out and I uh, um, brought a few friends together and we began a BDS campaign there, there was no way that they were ignorant to it. They knew the full consequences of their investments. Um, and we faced numerous challenges. And this was a four year long campaign where we initially passed um, democratically. I remember going to my student union and saying, well, what can I do? They said, pass a motion. So I said, okay, I'll pass a motion. Passed, it got a motion passed with the BDS campaign there that we formed um, and, and uh, passed by you know, a majority of the student body. And that didn't mean anything actually in terms of material divestment. Um, and the university, we had you know, protests every single, every other week outside of all of their meetings, stormed their meetings, did banner drops, everything you can, you can think of under the sun to try and pressure the university. And actually we had a vice chancellor who's still there um, Nancy Rothwell, who would only, who would meet with uh, one student who was actually um, very close to the Pinsker Center, an Israeli lobby group, um, and and would have numerous meetings with him, but would refuse to meet with Palestinian students like myself and other students on campus to discuss um, to discuss these investments and to to divest. It took a massive pressure campaign because often they don't want to succeed. They don't want to concede to these demands, it's only when it, the, the pressure becomes so overwhelming um, that, that it's ridiculous for them to hold on to these investments. And, you know, we had numerous different things come up, like um, a Holocaust survivor, Marika Sherwood, was censored at our university. And after Freedom of Information request, we discovered that, um, that the vice chancellor actually had a meeting with the Israeli embassy uh, a week before Israeli Apartheid Week in 2017 to discuss the concerns of the Israeli embassy over our campaign at the university, mm -hmm. rather than discussing the concerns of their own student body who are paying tuition fees, um, which is wrong in itself, that's a whole different issue, into a university. And imagine as a Palestinian, you're paying into a university, which is then paying, um, which is then investing into a company, which is demolishing Palestinian homes and profiting from that. Um, and this is just a small example of the deep complicity that these, that these institutions have. What, what what about uh, trade unions? I mean, how, how how helpful and effective have they been? Obviously, you know, they 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 faced things both ways because obviously a lot of members of trade unions are working in defence industries, but also, as you know, um, many trade unions have been very progressive over the years. And when they discover that uh, um, you know weapons are being used for repression and and against Palestinians, um, there's often a reaction. But what? What sort of support have you had there amongst the trade unionists? Um, so I would say that there is most of the, as we know, the British trade unions do have uh, policies that support uh, the BDS movement and support an arms embargo between the UK and, and Israel. Um, and for example, in Palestine Action, which is a direct action group that takes action um, to shut down Albert Systems, Israel's largest arms company in the UK, there was a recent action uh, just a couple of months ago where four activists occupy the roof of Albert Systems in Leicester. Um, and the fire brigade union, the fire service, usually assists the police in trying to get the protesters from the roof in order to arrest them and resume activities um, at Albert's factories where they're building on or the, the drones that they will use uh, to kill Palestinians and, and in, other, in other oppressive ways as well against other marginalized groups. Um, and the fire, the fire Brigade Union, actually uh, the chair of the Fire Brigade Union called on his members to refuse to assist uh, the police in removing, uh, in removing Palestine actionists from the roof, which was incredible. And that is now um, one of many times that the fire service is now systematically refusing and supporting Palestine action and refusing to assist in removing activists from the roof, even though in the eyes of the in eyes of the police, they may see it as as committing a crime when when we deem it as 
uh, preventing the much greater crime and doing what's necessary when governments fail the Palestinian people and continue to supply arms despite all of their arms export laws and knowing that this may very well be used to harm innocent Palestinians and they fail to ignore that, then people take action and um, the fire service seem to understand that. And it's been three times in one month that the fire service and every action had refused to assist the police, which actually meant in Leicester, they were they occupied the reef for six days in total, um, where normally it wouldn't... wouldn't um, well, all... that's, that's what you call real solidarity from the yeah. Fire Brigade Union. I'm just going to make a, read out a few messages um, uh, from viewers uh, from around the place. And, and, and to everybody watching, you know, do please send in your questions. Um, our guests are ready to take them. Uh, Daniela Conde says, glad to be here with you watching this incredibly important event. Um, Ruth Phelps says, thank you very much for organizing. Listening from Norfolk in the UK, uh, BDS Norfolk. Uh, Barbara Graveson says, this week, the United States House of Repres Representatives passed $20 million a, a day on behalf of Israel. Prior to this, the US taxpayer forks out over 10 million a day to Israel's military. Thank you, Obama. Well, look, um, Mika, if I could come to you. I mean, prior to the uh, recent attacks in Gaza, uh, uh, the terrible, uh, the terrible scenes that have been played out across screens across the world has been an eye opener for many, many people because of, really, I suppose the the growth of social media. We can get, we can see, we can see things that perhaps we didn't see as much of five, ten years ago. But prior to that, it did, I mean, this is a bit of a generalization, you might disagree, but it did It did seem that the BDS movement was a little bit on the back foot. Um, the, you know, Israel have been very effective. You've, you've talked of this yourself, you know, how effective the public relations machine can be from the uh, Israeli government and military and what have you. It did seem as though the BDS movement was on the back foot a bit. Do you think that what has happened in Gaza and what is continuing to happen in East Jerusalem with the ethnic cleansing that's going on there, the fact that people can see it, is giving greater strength to the BDS movement. And if so, you know, how is that, how is that manifesting itself? Well, before that, I just want to point out what Huda was describing is precisely the, the, the kind of the incredible work that is pushing this issue up and up and up in terms of the conversation um, here in America, in the UK, as in other places, that's exactly the the willing willingness to stand up like that as students, as student organizers, um, and 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 of course the Elbit uh, campaign is fantastic because Elbit is the devil, um, and any any opportunity to 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 stop their work is 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 a blessing. So um, I think I think we need to take a larger look at this in terms of the context. There are two ways to resist. Or, there, you know, there's the protests that come after the Israeli massacre. Uh, and, of course, like you said, after the, the, and it wasn't just Gaza in May. In May, I mean, there was an entire uprising throughout all of Palestine. I mean, Palestinians were united. All the, all the uh, artificial boundaries that Israel created, West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, uh, and, and then, you know, the citizens of Israel were all thrown out. Palestinians stood up and resisted as one people, as one nation, as a unified force. And that was incredible. I was there and it was incredible to see in the Nakab, you know, friends of mine, activists, citizens of Israel, thousands of them arrested, beaten, tortured in, in the Shabak chambers and all that. And, you know, in Lid, Ramle, everywhere. So, so that was the uprising. And what we saw around the world is we saw people protesting Israel's actions. Mm -hmm. And we saw huge numbers, I think unprecedented numbers here in the United States and other places. And that's great. The problem is that protesting after the fact, the 200 or so people that were murdered in Gaza are already dead. They're dead. We're late. These protests, as important as they are, they were too late for the people that were already killed. And then the next protest that come up after what is inevit will inevitably be another attack on Gaza, you know, that's also really late. The, 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 the call for BDS that came for Palestinians is a gift. It's a gift that was given to us by Palestinians saying, here is what you need to do to prevent the next death. 
here's what we need you to do to to defend the next Palestinian child, the next Palestinian activist from torture, the next Palestinian for, uh, uh, um, from having his home or her home demolished, the next Palestinian family from having the next Palestinian village from being destroyed. Because this is not a campaign that ever ends. On the one hand, you've got this really massive campaign of destruction and violence. And then you've got an ongoing campaign that calls for all of us to prevent the next event, to prevent, nobody else is defending Palestinians, nobody. Nobody's defending Palestinian children from the drones. Nobody's defending Palestinian activists from the torture chambers or from being shot and killed. You know, uh, 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 Nazar Banat was just killed. You know, I know other, so many Palestinians who are you know, arrested by the PA, arrested by the Israelis, tortured, beaten all the time. No one is there to defend them. If another one is killed, there'll be another protest. That'll be the end of it. <clears throat> BDS provides us with the tools to prevent the next attack, to prevent the next killing. But we have to grab it and run with it. Instead, what people do is they argue. It's anti-Semitic. It's not anti-Semitic. It's right. It's wrong. It's hurting this. It's hurting that. This was given to us as a gift by Palestinians to say, here is what we need you to do. Now act. You know, we, I mean, Palestinians do a great deal in Palestine. And it's incredible the work that's being done by Palestinians everywhere. In the Naqab, in, in Hebron, in Jerusalem, in the north, in Al-Jalil, in Yaffa, in Haifa. I mean, Palestinian activists are working all the time. But they are, they are held, they're held back by this enormous pressure that the Israeli state, the apartheid state, the systems of oppression are incredible, incredible. I don't think any of us who have not been on the side of the oppressed can even fathom what it means the pressure on the family the pressure on the employers to 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 to, uh, to you know to to stop the employment of people who are active and on and on and on you know we need to be there for them and how hard is it to understand that the call for bds is the most clear the most concise the most reasonable call ever by any nation i think that has uh, that is fighting for its liberation. What are they calling for? They're calling for remedial action, ending the occupa military occupation, equal rights, the right of return. These are all things that have already been sanctioned by the international community, by the United Nations, by international law. Resolution 194 is the most reinstated uh, resolution in the history of the United Nations. You know, these are all things that are already that are completely reasonable and 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 remedial. They're not going to hurt anyone. So why is it so difficult for people? And, and the only answer that I can provide is that the other side, the Zionist PR machine is working very, very hard to, to, you know, to fight this. But it's a gift that was given to us. And what we need to do is we need to grab this gift and we need to run with it. So it is front and center in every conversation, in every political debate. Every time someone runs for office, they need to commit to wearing the a pin like I do that supports boycott, divestment and sanctions to commit to resist Zionism. That's the only way we can do this. But we have no, to grab I'm, this. I'm going to, I'm going to come in here, if, if I may, because I have got a question here uh, for you. This is from uh, Ahmed Faza. And uh, he says, in light of the re recent opinion polls amongst Jewish American citizens and Israelis, Jewish Israelis, on what they thought of claims such as that Israel is committing crimes of apartheid, occupation, and genocide towards Palestinians, how do you foresee the effectiveness of BDS going forward as an essential tool to dismantle the power dynamics and this, I think this is the important thing, and the unwavering support of the Biden administration for the status quo? And also that of governments such as the UK and Germany, um, who are currently, says I'm Ahmed, silencing any pro-Palestinian discourse under the newer definition of anti-Semitism. Um, so what, what do you make of that? Well, first of all, there's no there's no status quo. There's an ongoing massive violent campaign to destroy Palestine. There's no status quo. Every single moment we sit here, another Palestinian child is in danger of dying. Another Palestinian activist is in danger of being tortured. Another Palestinian home is in danger of being destroyed. And Palestinian neighborhoods and cities are in danger of being ruined forever. All the way to Jerusalem, to the old city, to Al-Aqsa. So let's not kid ourselves that there's some kind of a status quo going on. There is no status quo. There's, an, there's a massive campaign of destruction and violence and oppression. Now, um, there, there are a lot of elements in this question. The United States and the United Kingdom and other European countries have, always, have had a Zionist foreign policy 
and they maintain a dishonest foreign policy. We know that. But these are elected governments. We want to change that. Then it's up to us to get up and 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 muster up the kind of courage that Huda was describing and act. And act. People of conscience need to understand that they must stand against Zionism, period. Just like they stood against other fascist regimes and racist regimes and racist ideologies, period. The whole IHRA nonsense, and it's very powerful. I don't mean it's nonsense that it's not effective. It's a very effective campaign. But to compare the fight against Zionism, the fight against a violent racist ideology with anti-Semitism is insulting to Jews. It's mm. insulting to Jews everywhere. Mm. There's nothing Jewish about Zionism at all. It's a racist ideology. It's an oppressive ideology. It's violent. And standing up for it is the right thing to do, regardless of, of anyone's religion. Huda, I mean, coming to you, I mean, when Mika was talking about standing up and looking to, to, to people to change their governments, as we, we can do, I, mean, I just wanted to bring, this is a domestic UK situation, I suppose, but I mean, arguably, uh, you could say that here in Britain, um, we did actually have a Labour Party leader in Jeremy Corbyn and a foreign policy that was possibly the most pro-Palestinian it had been since, um, well, since the early 1980s, I suppose. And look what happened. So this must this must uh, this must make people think. Well, what can I do when we actually have a, a a party with half a million members, and it's it's going to be calling for an end to Israeli apartheid policies, and we'll actually be quite serious about uh, having a foreign policy to be effective to do it. What can we do if we get there, but we still get rebuffed? That's what a lot of people will say. Yeah, no, definitely, and I. I couldn't agree more with what Miko said um, as well before. And going on to that, I think, you know, the Labour Party, for example, I was um, I was quite active in and uh, pushed alongside many others for the arms embargo, which we actually saw for the first time in 2019. And I remember being absolutely ecstatic that for the first time ever, there was actually a UK uh, arms embargo between the UK and Israel on the Labour Party manifesto. Um, and I think as with many others, the, crush, the hopes and dreams of that being the, the, the channel of change died at that day of the general election. We saw what happened with Keir Starmer coming in. And it also, I think, woke many people up, including myself and others who, um, who went on to find Palestine action because we were tired of appealing to the same politicians to trying through the, what they say is the appropriate democratic channels. And really, there was nothing democratic about it. Um, most people, if you ask them, do you want an arms embargo between the UK and Israel, would say would ag would agree with that. But we are never going to get that through the democratic channels. We've seen it time and time again. I'm, um, I'm, as you mentioned before, I'm Iraqi on my mother's side and Palestinian on my father's side. And I, I saw I was quite young, but I saw when over one million people went to protest against the Iraq war and they went and alongside the US and they went and massacred uh, one million uh, Iraqi civilians and destroyed the country. And if we talk about protests and as Miko said, it being a reactive thing as well, it's, it's, it's the same cycle. It's, it's Gaza gets bombed, people come out and then things quieten down and we go back to the status quo and then it gets bombed and, and, and we need to focus. And for us at Palestine Action, we realised that there is no point anymore in trying to appeal directly to the same politicians who have been enabling, um, and even those who don't, don't have the power to change it who've been enabling Israel's apartheid regime, profiting from it for over 100 years now. And when we see that Albert Systems, Israel's largest arms company, are literally making these weapons down the road from many of our communities, in Muslim communities, in communities where people are not happy when they find out that they have an arms company, an Israeli arms company, making these weapons operating on our doorsteps in the West, in Western countries. They are never, these weapons are never built in front of the people that they will kill. And actually it's basic human instinct. If you see somebody um, about to be hurt, most people would step in the way. And when we see these weapons and its components made um, for Israel in our towns and cities, and then we have a direct ability to stop it. And the consequences, and there are many different ways of doing it, but the consequences of taking direct action are nothing nothing compared to the consequences of those weapons and what they will do to Palestinian families. And they don't just send it as, you know, what they do, they basically, Albert Systems, use Gaza as a laboratory and market their weapons as tested. 
they build them here, these tested weapons, and they're sent to Israel, and they're sent to India, and an oppressive regimes across the world uh, to massacre people. And when we have certain privilege in the West, and when a government continues to fail the people, to ignore international law, to ignore their own arms exports laws, uh, we saw 380,000 people sign a petition for sanctions. And I watched that debate, and I couldn't watch more than 20 minutes because it was just the same rhetoric time and time again. And it just reaffirms that we are not going to achieve the change from the top. And, and, and for me and many others in Palestine Action, and hope for those who join us as well in the future and those who are joining us now, we realize that trying to get an arms embargo through the government is, is not going to achieve the same results as, and we can go and directly stop Israel's arms company oh, no, where see. they are um, and implement it ourselves. Yeah. Huda, I can I can see exactly where you're coming from. I, I suppose just to be as devil, I mean, and this, let's just focus uh, on the domestic situation in this country as well over the slightly longer term. Because I remember that Iraq march too. I was a speaker as it happened, and um, a million people, and still that illegal war went on. But the byproduct of all of that, of course, was that essentially uh, the Labour Party lost most of its vote over a period of time, and in in the end enabled Jeremy Corbyn, who was the peace campaign and anti-war candidate, to become leader. So things can happen um, over a period of time. But of course, what you're saying, I'm sure, is that, you know, we can't really wait for these things to happen. And I suppose the point might also be, well, OK, you don't want to be wasting your time you know, trying to have a dialogue with people who don't want to hear. But that in, for instance, by-elections, we've just had one, um, in uh, Batley and Spen in Lancashire, in Yorkshire, I beg your pardon, the uh, Labour Party almost lost. And that was essentially because a lot of voters went there, uh, there were very, very angry about um, the Labour Party's policy on Palestine. Yeah, and no, I would say I would say a few things to that. I don't think that protests are not necessarily counterproductive in any way, but I don't, we see it, it's not achieving it's not saving those lives. And, and I, I think sometimes it's, 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 it's easy to kind of forget the urgency of the, um, or not feel that urgency every day when, when we live here in, in, in the West, mm -hmm. but it's an urgent situation, as Miko said, every single day Palestinians are facing, um, you know, threat of losing their lives, of losing their homes. Um, in Iraq, it didn't matter what the consequences were for our own British politics when those people were being killed and their towns are being destroyed. And, you know, my own family, we lost internet. We couldn't speak to them for over a year. We didn't know if they were dead or alive. Those don't change um, because our politics may have shifted slightly in the West. Mm -hmm. and, and when we have an ability to, to take direct action um, and, and have a direct impact on these things, then I believe that that's 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 what that's what needs to be done and and more and more people are are doing that and i think we're also in a time where we've seen movements like extinction rebellion we've seen people who are tired of of the political status quo um people like myself who have done many different forms of campaigning and have actually you know I might be jumping around a bit but i've done many different forms of campaigning i've done research writing letters spoke to numerous mps etc and one of the most powerful moments was when i took a ladder and i climbed on top of an israeli arms factory and i realized that just in that moment that factory was closed and that there was it was reaching so many people in media and people in that village were coming out and going wow i didn't know about this and were supporting us and that actual impact that direct financial impact if you do that on a mass scale then it doesn't it, it no longer matters exactly mm -hmm. about about these about the the politics or the government in power because i truly believe that we're only going to change the government's policies when there's such a groundswell and when they realize that not only are people coming out en masse, but people are risking their liberty because this, ma this issue matters so much and they are so disgusted by the fact that, th that Israel's arms companies are operating here and building these weapons here, that they are willing to go out and get arrested um, in order to shut these places down, that when that becomes too much, then we, we create a, a wave of pressure which works from the bottom up. Um, and I think I don't think you know the other methods are necessarily counterproductive, but I don't. I, I think we've seen the same thing time and time again, and Palestinians are suffering day in day out. And when we can't have the same thing happen 
time and time again we have to try new things and we have to be willing to push it a bit more um and if that means you know different people as well i've seen it in palestine action are coming out um and from different movements and saying and saying that they are they understand it that they're with it and that they want to do the same thing who who feel that same way i think the problem with the you know the government and politics is that um many people feel like they don't have a voice which to be honest is true mm-hmm. um and that actually there are other ways to be heard and and more and more people um who if they've come from extinction rebellion if they've come from muslim backgrounds who've been discriminated against in this country for so long are going no actually i'm not going to be ignored i'm not going to not be listened to when people are dying and this is off down the road i might chain myself to a gate and get arrested you know and it's it's something so simple, but it's putting your body on the line and realizing that these weapons are built in front of us. And if it was the other way around, we would be begging for other people to have that same urgency and to do the same thing, especially when their government is failing to do that. And how, how, how much faith are we gonna to continue to put um, in, 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 in these things which don't create the necessary shift um, quick enough to match the urgency of the situation and it's matching that urgency and there's nothing you can't compare throwing paint on a building to dropping bombs and destroying people's lives it's nothing Miko I mean that's a very very powerful call for action and for direct action and uh, you know historically it has been very effective in um, in many respects and not just when it comes to Palestine, but South Africa, we've already talked about. Uh, and the focus we've had has been very much on what the uh, what's happening uh, in Britain uh, and to a degree the United States. But looking around the world, you would think there would be a lot more uh, support for the boycott and divestment sanctions movement, especially in the Middle East. Um, and I'm not talking about on the street, because there would be, but I'm talking about at government level. Um, what, what is it? What needs to happen there? Uh, and, and why isn't there a greater degree, do you think, of international solidarity uh, with the Palestinians? Why have the Palestinians been kind of conveniently sort of forgotten until there's the war in Gaza and governments are forced to react? Well, I think what we learned from and what we saw happen in the UK Labour Party with Jeremy Corbyn, like you said, he was a, he was a candidate that that he was the activist that became candidate that nobody ever thought would happen. <laughs> he and, didn't either. <laughs> uh, I don't think he expected it either. But then, but then the campaign against him, I I think I wrote this something in 2017 that Israel is going to stop at nothing. They're going to stop at nothing. They will not allow this man to enter, to set foot at Downing Street 10. And they didn't. And, you know, the Israeli Hasbara, the Israeli Ministry of, of, of uh, Strategic Affairs, took pride in actually saying, we brought down Jeremy Corbyn. And by the way, we prevented Bernie Sanders as well from becoming the candidate for the Democratic Party. So they're not even, they're not even shy about this. Now, look at the Arab world. Look at the Arab world. What happened to the countries that stood up? The countries that did, that stood up to Zionism and stood up to the Zionist uh, foreign policy of the United States and, and Western Europe. Look at Iraq. Look at Syria. Look at Yemen. Look at Libya. Now, you're a leader of a country, an Arab world, and you go, okay, what are my choices here? Am I going to bring total destruction on my country and my people? Or do I go along with this and, and, and hold my nose? And of course, these are not, you know, most of these governments don't represent the people, you know, for, 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 certainly for Palestinians, but for Arabs everywhere, boycotting Israel is, is an instinct. You don't need, they don't need to be told to boycott Israel. You know, you don't see Israel has, it has diplomatic relations with Jordan and with Egypt. You don't see Egyptian tourists in Tel Aviv, you don't see Jordanians coming. You know, you don't see that. You're not going to see that either now with the new, with the with the, with the new accords with the, with the Gulf states and so on. But for the regimes, they can either get the funding, the weapons, um, and the riches that they so crave by going along with the Zionist foreign policy, 
or they can see death and destruction and look at what happened to Iraq and that's going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. These are the choices that they're faced with. And as long as, and it goes back to the beginning, as long as countries like the UK and the US and Germany and others have a Zionist foreign policy, this is how it's going to be. You know, there's a reason why Israel uh, has worked so hard to have relations with Arab regimes from the very beginning. I mean, the Zionist uh, movement, even before the state was established, was already bribing and working and providing and working with these Arab regimes as to, 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 to get them to collaborate. There's but, a reason for that. D David Harrop says, um, uh, Israel seeks to position itself as the global leader in terms of counterterrorism. This is a very valuable product, which is placed in the global marketplace. And maybe Israel's viability is dependent on this military arms consultancy revenue. Now, there's a fiscal market value to a narrative of Palestinians being terrorists uh, and a fabricated existential threat to democracy. If there was any desire to end the occupation, it could happen tomorrow or could have happened at any time since 1967. What do you make? What do you make of that? Uh, which one of us? Who are you asking me? Oh, yeah, you carry on. Yeah, um, yeah. You, you know, I mean, they, they could have started 1947. I mean, the, uh, you know, the occupation of Palestine didn't begin in 67. It began in 1948. So, I mean, certainly, certainly, what I find what I find quite ridiculous is that Israel markets itself as some kind of a military expert or an expert at fighting terrorism. Israel had never, ever, ever fought a battle it didn't know it was going to win. Mm -hmm. Israel has never, ever dealt with terrorists because there's no such thing as Palestinian terrorism. Israel was always the biggest force, the best trained, best equipped, best financed force. So whenever they went to war, and of course they initiated the vast majority of, of, of uh, military confrontations, of course they were going to win. They went in knowing they were going to win. They wouldn't have initiated these wars if they didn't know they were going to win. And so, and then they come back and they say, look, we defeated these great Arab armies. What great Arab armies? Take a look at the numbers, take a look at the financing, take a look at everything from the food the soldiers get to eat to the weapons of the training. It was a joke. This whole joke that somehow Israel was under threat and managed to you know, overcome great, uh, great adversaries and terrorism is nonsense. What terrorism? What are we talking about? If these people, you know, if you should meet the Palestinians who are, you know, the terrorists when they come out of jail or when they are released somehow, you know, it's a joke. They are, they're, they're experts at nothing, but they're very good at marketing themselves. Mm -hmm. And here in America, and I think in the UK too, you know, there's this admiration for Israeli military. What are you admiring? What have they done? Mm -hmm. Not a single Israeli general today has ever done anything but kill young Palestinians or bomb, uh, you know, innocent people in Lebanon. That's mm -hmm. that's their career. I, I do remember a similar admiration some years ago in this country for the South African and Rhodesian military. But then, of course, it all fell away when people could see what was really happening. Look, there's a message here. This is from uh, Yano Yasser. He says, um, hello, I'm from Egypt. We had two BDS actors, activists that have been arrested for three years now. We tried having protests last month and almost every one of that protest is in jail now. Can we help at all? Well, there we are. Uh, look, there's a question. There's a question here um, uh, for for you, uh, Huda, and it's this is from Omar from London. He says um, uh, he asks, "Have you received much support from Palestinians themselves? Are Palestinians in Gaza aware of your campaign, for instance? And have you seen similar campaigns springing up against Israeli weapons factories operating in other countries?" Um. Thank you for that question. It was definitely we have, and I think um, it's kind of the power of uh, social media when we're when we're allowed on it. We've had some issues, but um, in in the majority of our uh, of our actions, um, activists who do go on the roof, uh, blog into Palestine Action, and they they often go live, and the messages that come in and you know the outpour of mm. solidarity and support from Gaza and Palestine and Jerusalem, it's it's nonstop and it's very. I think many activists have said about how reassuring it is and and how you can you, you're reaching those people where um these weapons would be affecting them um at the end of the day and that solidarity is, is very is very real and um often in uh, during the the recent onslaught in gaza which, which never stops um we were live often with people in gaza sometimes you would hear their bombings in the background and they were mm -hmm. saying you know we were so we're pleased about the direct action and this is exactly what 
what what we want because that the lives are at risk every every minute of the day and when they see that same urgency coming back to before um they support that and and um and so we've definitely had had a lot of support and actually often when we're, when we're speaking with them you, know, you can hear that they'll be talking about the drones the sound of the drones above their heads and th those will literally be the same drones or the same parts that are produced in the Comp in the in the factories that we target, which are making these parts for these drones, if not the full drones um, themselves here here in the UK. And if anything, it brings it brings back just how important it is to do this kind of to do this kind of work. And in terms of you know other campaigns um, against Israel's weapons factories, there's definitely been um, a, a, a pouring in of messages from around the world of people wanting to take similar action in their countries. Now I. We always say that there is a diversity of tactics of indirect action, and um, you kind of have to find out which one works best for the circumstances in different countries. Um, but we've had people take action in Austria, um, in Australia, and people in America and Canada who who are constantly talking about potentially maybe taking action um, against against uh, companies, uh, Albert Systems, or their partners um, in their country because Albert Systems. Uh, they are all across the world, as you can imagine, um, especially in Europe, US and Australia. Um, but across Europe, it's, it's very notable that they are mostly densely populated in the UK where they have 10 sites and they're kind of dotted across the rest of Europe. A lot of that has to do with the fact that they have diplomatic ties with the UK. And as we were talking about before, about the, you know, the marketing themselves in this military way is definitely something which is true in the UK. Um, and you know, the, the marketing of battle tested weapons um, is something that we constantly see and has worked to win contracts by the UK authorities. They The same drones which are used to harass and kill and surveil Palestinians in Gaza are the ones that they are now going to use to surveil and stop migrants from seeking refuge and safety in this country. Um, and the UK police force are also going to be trialing these drones as this technology which they are you know, they, they will uh, advertise as how well they've used it in Gaza and other places and we're, we're buying it. You know, this is coming out of our money. Um, and it just shows how these companies profit from every, the cycle of, you know, we wouldn't call it war, but the cycle of oppression from the, from the destroying people's lives, destroying people's homes to then um, and in, in Gaza, in Kashmir, Myanmar, et cetera. And then when people are fleeing, it's the same company profiting from, um, from them trying to seek safety um, in, in these countries as well. And it, it, it comes back a lot of times to where we are. And I think when we campaign, we always have to think about what we can do from where we are. Um, Rudra, it's a tough one for you and for, uh, for, uh, for Palestine action in many ways, because you can win at the moral argument. You can make a very persuasive argument. You can reach new people. You were telling us that when you occupied that Edward factory you know, locally, people didn't really know what was going on. And suddenly in their midst, they discovered there was this company exporting military back to Israel. But technically, you're breaking the law, of course. That means, and I know about this because when I was um, a bit younger, I was arrested outside an American air base in East Anglia for cutting a wire. Um, this was deemed to be criminal damage. And I was taken off to court and charged and fined. Unfortunately, my father was an uh, army officer, a bit like Biko's dad. And uh, he wasn't best pleased. He was at a NATO base. He said, what are you doing supporting the campaign for nuclear disarmament? Now, he could see that I had a moral argument for what I was doing, but I had break, broken the law. So you must also face, and here's a question. This is from Stephen Watters. Um, how often, because what you're doing is technically illegal, how often do Palestine Action have problems from companies like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, GoFundMe, etc. Um, well, I'll say I say a couple of points. I mean, I think it goes without saying about how sometimes, you know, the 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 law can be wrong in so many ways. And when the law basically makes it wrong to stop an arms company who are manufacturing weapons, which will likely be used in war crime, then there's a strong justification to say sometimes you just have to do the right thing over what the law might say at that time um, and despite the consequences that's often how many things have changed um, in history by not accepting the status the status quo and there are different consequences for that and um, 
at Palestine Action, it was just three, three, four weeks after we had launched. And there was actually a meeting between the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs and um, Dominic Raab uh, here, in the U- here in the UK. Um, I think the meeting was in Jerusalem. And they basically asked um, to, crush, to crush our movement, which, which, was, um, which made me and others in Palestine Action absolutely ecstatic, to be honest, because you, know, you, you campaign on these issues. And when you see such a strong response from, from Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs, you know you're, you're kind of going on the right path of things and, um, and are not exactly liking it, which can only be a good thing um, in terms of the potential that the movement that the movement has, but that has come with some backlash. Um, and we have had been removed by Facebook. And obviously the issue is that Facebook on Instagram. Um, and often actually, you know, social media was supposed to democratize the internet, but in fact, it's owned by the same people. Um, it's owned by a couple of people and uh, you don't have, you know, there's a lot of issues there. Um, mm. You were recently, we've been removed from eight different platforms. Um, and actually, where we've got removed from Instagram, we're now back on Instagram after two, three days of um, of, of harassing them, to say the least. Um, but I think, and we saw the last fundraising platform took, who took us down actually came and told us, look, we're really sorry, but we got an email from Albert's lawyers who are basically saying, if you support this campaign, we will threaten you with a legal, um, with a civil lawsuit and bankrupt your company. Um, so, that's the kind of what we're what we're facing against, and we've moved a lot of things onto our own website, our own platforms. We're, and and the thing is, if you're challenging as well as a part of regime, and and people are willing to to shut down these factories with their own bodies, you're going to face some backlash, and I think that backlash is to be expected, um, in order to actually in the end win win the goal. Um, mm. So we go with it, and we just move on each time. And I think it's a form of flattery that Albert's lawyers spend so much time trying to get our fundraising platforms removed, even though we don't get as much money as we need. So it doesn't. Well, you know you what? Know, I'm going to come in. Uh, you know, we're, we're, sadly, we're entering into our final moments, and uh, what you're ending with there, you can come back and tell us a bit more about because people want to know how they can help. And in fact, just one last point from Peter Hignell. He says uh, Yano Yasser's question. This is the uh, guy from Egypt. Was read out, but nobody had an answer to. to uh, nobody had a chance to answer it. So briefly, to you. Both. It's a difficult question, deserving an answer. It's a question from Yano, who would like to know how he and they can help in Egypt, even though it sounds like they need some help. But coming to you, Miko, and then to you, Huda, what can we do going forward, all of us? Well, if you're living, if you're living in an oppressive regime, you're going to have some serious problems. And we know that um, uh, we saw what happened in Egypt when the Egyptian people spoke then they ended up uh, having a, a military coup that was suppo- supported by by israel and the united states and now the, the the leader of the coup is president so of course you're gonna have you're not gonna you're not if you if you're standing up against zionism you're not gonna get a lot of support from the government so that's just the conditions like who that was saying you need to find the thing that works in your particular country i don't think egyptians buy a lot of israeli products anyway so i don't think there's a, that big issue you know right there at all, you don't see Egyptians, uh, you know, coming to Tel Aviv to shop or anything like that. So I, I don't think that that is the issue in that particular country. So I don't know that I have a good answer for for for, for people who live in Egypt, unfortunately. Maybe Huda does. I don't know. Huda, not just Egypt, but everywhere, and uh, particularly here in Britain and also in the United States. Well, um, I would agree with Miko. It's um, when you're in oppressive regimes, it's it's uh, it's most difficult. And I've always done it from the experience of knowing about these issues, but being privileged enough to have been brought up in Britain um, and and using that freedom to do and push it here where we do have those freedoms to take action. Um, and even even if that may lead to arrest, it's nothing compared to, you know, we actually have, you know, it can be unjust most of the time, but um, it's nothing compared to what people go through across the world in terms of a legal system. Um, and we have much more freedom and privilege, uh, which is often built on the backs of oppressed people across the world. So it's our responsibility to use that. Um, and I think to be sustained and effective and focused in our campaigning as well. Um, and for us at Palestine Action, that means taking action against um, Albert Systems and companies who, who directly support and facilitate um, their operations in the UK and across the world. So I would encourage people to visit uh, palestineaction.org. Please do donate. Um, 
we you know all all funds go directly towards the campaign um and and uh, yes please do follow us on our social media platforms while we still have them Thank you. Well, there's a, actually, there's a suggestion here too, and this is also from Stephen Watters. He says, maybe Miko can help by interviewing Huda uh, next time they're due in court, like he did interviewing Issa Amro in December before his court appearance. Well, I don't know anything about all of that, but I'm sure that makes a lot of good sense. And yeah, I think that's a great idea. won't end up in court, but anyway. But look, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So Peter Hignell says, thanks to you all for this evening. Good to hear Huda and Miko. Solidarity. Sandra Shatilla says, thank you very much for this very informative webinar. Um, we've had people from all over the world sending in messages. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but I'm very, very grateful. We're all very grateful here at Palestine Deep Dive to Mika Pellet and Huda Amori. We'd love to have you back. I hope you'll join us again. Um, if you don't subscribe to Polis Pal Palestine Deep Dive out there, please do. You'll get a daily newsletter uh, and, um, and much else besides. So thank you very, very much for our guests. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you all, says Barbara. So there we are. Thank you. Until next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.